Good evening and welcome to another exciting Word Up Bible study. Word Up. Get someone on, let them know we are going into our other uh, chapter 2 of our lesson, our exciting lesson in the book of Habakkuk. Most people don't even know who Habakkuk is or because we don't look at the minor prophets that often. But I'm going to give you some exciting news about how relevant Habakkuk is to us now. So get ready. This is Pastor Duncans. And again, I'm coming here for my study because I want you to know that tonight we're going to study the Bible. And guess what? I even got a Bible. I got all these other devices that I use, but I have a Bible here with me so that we can read. And we're going to exposit verse by verse. Grab your Bible. Get excited about God speaking through his word tonight. We started last week with this exciting uh, series, and it's a three I think we'll have three studies in the series of Habakkuk, three chapters, three studies. I'm going to try to get through a chapter tonight. Each chapter is relevant to your life because of who Habakkuk was and what Habakkuk did. So let's pray, and then we're going to go into the study of Habakkuk. Make sure right now you're letting some people know we're on. Many people got blessed through this study last week, and I'm going to pray right now so we can get ready to hear what God is going to Say with us. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father God, again, we come thanking you for your word, thanking you for your presence, knowing, God, that we cannot live without having you give us knowledge and direction and guidance. Lord, I pray that someone who tunes into this study tonight will recognize your sovereign power and know that everything is still in control. And God, right now, I ask that you would bless my mind, bless the teaching, bless the words. And as we study the lessons that you wanted us to get through this great prophet, Habakkuk. And we thank you right now for everything that shall happen in Jesus' name. Amen. Grab your Bibles and go with me to Habakkuk chapter 1. Chapter 1. Now, we're going to go to chapter 2. But I need to get you to understand what and, and the reality of what Habakkuk was doing. And the first verse of Habakkuk chapter 1 says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. The second verse gives us a clue. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of the violence, and thou wilt not save. Let's talk about it. Habakkuk was one of the minor prophets. He was the eighth minor prophet. Minor, not in their uh, weight or what they were saying, uh, but they were minor in what they wrote. Most of the minor prophets, there are 12 of them. He was the eighth minor prophet. They wrote during the time to speak what God wanted spoken, but it was God speaking directly for a specific time. And what happened with Habakkuk, Habakkuk did something that no one else did. And I gave this study a theme last week. And here what our theme is. And that is, God, we need some answers. Almost shocking. God, I need some answers. We're almost taught not to ask God or not to question God when, when things don't go the way that we want them to go. You know, too many times on this faith journey, if I could get a witness, sometimes our uh, the facts of my situation contradict the faith of my situation. Everybody know what I'm saying? Sometimes I'm, I'm standing by faith, but the facts are all in my face telling me, are you sure this is what God said? Well, Habakkuk said, I'm just not going to sit there and not ask God because I'm hurting too much. This burden that I have is for my people. So Habakkuk is different because he didn't give the people of God an oracle or, or just say, hey, this is what God said, straighten up. No, he went straight to God. And I want you to learn something right there. Habakkuk said, you better quit listening to this prophet and that prophet and, and this, uh, you know, we want to go and get this apostle or this pastor. And No, God said, you can come to me for yourself. I hope the first thing you open up and learn tonight is that when you open up to God, you can speak yourself. Look at what Abaka did and understand he questioned God. Two great questions he asked God. 
Same questions all of us have. In that first chapter, that burden on his heart was because of his love for God, his love for his position, his love for his walk, his love for his work. But the burden was, God, why are you allowing all this stuff to happen? And secondly, why are you going to tackle it this way? So let's deal with that because I want us to be able to relate to Habakkuk. All of us know that we've asked God this question. Why is almost like, I don't want to do that. But most of us know that we have had the same thought that Abaka had was, God, if you're so powerful, if you're in control, why is all this evil happening? If you are an all-powerful God, why did my husband die and yet I saw where a drug dealer made it through a shootout? God, if you're so all-powerful, why am I having all the trouble I'm having in my life, and I'm a believer serving you every day, and you got people running around who aren't serving you at all, and my life seems like it's not. God, I just want to know why. And we ask God these questions. Why is my child sick? Why am I going through this? And Abaka said, I am perfect for you to study because in the time that we're living in, God wants us to know that he will answer why. You ought to get ready for this because Habakkuk pulls no punches. He tells us to ask what God is saying. So it's a perfect, if I could just divert for a minute, that first verse tells us in chapter one that Habakkuk questioned God. Get that in your mind. You can question God. It's all right. But also, the part of this theme says, God, I need some answers. I have some questions. And God says, I will answer but watch God, but keep living by faith. I love that. I will answer. God never says I'm going to shirk from the answer. God is very transparent. God will answer. I'm going to teach you how to get to the answer that God has for us. But we need to really, really understand. I told you I was going to approach some issues here that, that's making Habakkuk perfect for me as a pastor. Watching how the church is going. Anybody be honest out there who knew who knew the days when we had some church? Is there anybody with me? Where are the folks that can say, these young folk haven't seen any good old church? Can I get an amen? I'm talking about elbow to elbow, shouting, hot, sweating, and the spirit of God coming down and an anointing. I'm talking, we can't, now, you know, I know because of the pandemic, but I'm talking about from the door, from the youngest to the oldest, there was this camaraderie, this common bond that had a respect for the word of God. We are now in a culture that's moving by light speed that does not respect the word of God the way that they used to. You know what I'm saying? This culture, uh, their beliefs and their practices don't keep God in the high esteem. So we have a, a culture that's coming forth that's inquisitive. And here is the problem. The church doesn't want to answer the question. You know what I mean? The and I, I, I watch this as I go through generations that we as, as believers and especially as leaders, we ought to be able to, and the Christian word is apologetics, we ought to be able to answer some questions without getting frustrated. But here is what the church is, what the world is accusing us of, anti-intellectualism. You know what that is? That means that we want to give a simple answer and we don't want anybody going into a healthy, vibrant conversation to question the answers that we give them from the Bible. And because we don't do that, we, we, we go into this place where we just want to give you our safe answer and we get mad if you question our answer because that's just how us think. Or we go the other way, which is hyper-intellectualism, where we go and just retreat back to our good old church language. Well, uh, I'm going to exposit uh, this text and this is what I'm preaching from this pericope and I want you to know that if you go into a vibrant alliteration of what I'm speaking you will under the world don't want to hear that the world wants to know how can you help me with my problem that's why Habakkuk is perfect I'm going to show you how to answer because Habakkuk found the way to answer because there's other areas that people are leaving the church because we don't want to answer their questions gender sexual identity Church don't want to speak about it. We want to give an answer. Say, I found this in Romans, and that settles it. No, we're talking to human beings. That's not what Jesus would have done. We got to make sure we can answer. That means we got to make sure we get into the word and know so we can answer. But also racial reconciliation. You know, it's something. I see a lot of 
my evangelical brothers. We're supposed to be going to the same heaven. They don't believe in social justice or racial reconciliation. They just believe, they want to say there's no liberation in the Bible, that there, there's no place for setting people free. All of this, God is going to get us to answer these questions. But these questions go from theological questions down to morality and personal behavior. And God is saying, we as the church need to be able to answer these questions for folk. And if we don't, then the church is not going to be as powerful or get the word of God across. But watch this. Also, you people, I'm not talking about just millennials. We've worn that word out. Also, you jokers out there, I'm talking about every generation. Once we give you an answer from the Bible, don't act like your authority is somehow higher than our authority. Come on, you know what I'm saying? You give somebody a biblical answer to a question, and then they want to, because it wasn't the answer they thought about, because of their selfishness and their need, they tell us that that's wrong, and then they want to say the church is not compassionate because they've now built themselves up as an authority based on worldly language. How do we get through all of this? Come on, let's go back to the Bible. We get through this by Habakkuk. What about Habakkuk? Habakkuk is the answer, because you know what Habakkuk says? Here it is. I wish I had a drum roll right here. Here's the magic answer. Go to God for yourself. Can I get an amen? Go to God for yourself. I found this out. I can't go with the crowd. I can't go with the popular belief. I got to go to God myself. And I guarantee you, if you cultivate a relationship with God, he'll teach us how to love, how to move, and how to go in the right direction. So Habakkuk said, you got to have a relationship yourself. Habakkuk, in this first chapter, go be to chapter one. He asked God two questions. The first one I gave you, and the second question, when God answered him, God, Habakkuk said, why is all this evil going on? And God, why are you letting it happen? Perfect question. The burden on my heart said, God, I can't keep living like this, keep worshiping you, serving you, and you don't answer me for this stuff. What's going on? And if I could have some nerve, didn't he? But then he also said to God, God said, well, I'm going to answer. I'm going to do a work in your day, right here in the text, that you won't, you won't understand. I'm, I'm working on it. And then God answered him. He said, well, how are you going to do it? God said, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. I discussed this last week. Please don't ask God why, or please don't ask God for something, or please don't ask God to do something. And then when God gives you a divine way he's going to do it, act like that's not what God is supposed to do. Still get angry with him. Still retreat from praying and having your relationship daily with God. God said, no, you need to know that my ways are higher than your ways. We need to thank God that his ways are higher than our ways because it's the only way God chose us to be a part of his kingdom because he saw something in us that we did not see in our sinful nature. Somebody ought to be glad that God's ways can look beyond our faults and see our needs. He says, so the way I'm going to do it, you may not understand. He said, but I'm God. Here's what he said. I'm going to bring the Chaldeans in and they're going to. They're going to come and they're going to take you captive. And he goes through the verses telling him what he's going to do. And then at the end of the chapter, Habakkuk is still shocked. I like, I like his energy. Habakkuk says, God, if you're supposed to be the all-knowing holy God. Now, God didn't say this. Habakkuk said this. He said, if you're, look at verse 13. Um, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. And cannot look on iniquity. Wherefore, look at look at the look at the excuse me, um, on the iniquity. Wherefore, look at the whom thou is sending to deal treacherously with us. So y'all with me? Here's what God. Here's what Habakkuk is saying. God, why would you use somebody more evil than us? Why would you use the Chaldeans? And then God gives him an answer of what he's going to do. And that takes us into chapter 2. But let's kind of get a handle on where Habakkuk is. Because Habakkuk said in first verse of chapter 2. Y'all go with me? Chapter 2 of Habakkuk. Go to chapter 2. He said, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Here's what Habakkuk said. 
God, even though I don't understand what you're doing, I'm going to watch and wait and listen for what you're going to say to me. Please write this down. God will answer. Most of the people in the Bible who did powerful things for God is because the first order of their confidence was God was real and they waited to have God speak to them. He said, I'm going to watch and I'm going to wait to see what God will say. Okay. Am I talking to somebody? Have you watched and wait? The figure here is him sitting on a watchtower, meaning that he still had the proper attitude. I don't want you to think that Habakkuk was getting snippet with God. What Habakkuk was doing was Habakkuk was saying, God, I don't want to, you know, I don't want you to be angry. I got to ask you one more question. I'm respectful and I do know that you have the right, but I know you're going to answer me. That's the blessing. I want somebody to know right now, whatever the question is, maybe you've been looking for the pulpit to answer it. Maybe you've been going to this preacher and that church and you've been sitting around in your own mind. But have you ever thought about in your mind saying, God, I'm going to sit somewhere quietly and watch and see what you will say to me. He was respectful enough to know that we have to wait on God. Wait on God. Why wait on God? Look, look what Habakkuk was up against. Most of the time, you got to know the background because that's what people tell me when you get into your problem. The reason sometimes the preaching doesn't do anything or what somebody's saying doesn't do anything is because you are in your own world and I don't really know what you're going through. I never claim when I'm preaching to preach this one side of preaching that, yeah, and all you got to do is this, this, this. No, I know that context matters. Uh, what you've been through, what you're going through, how you've cried, your circumstances. So your faith means more to God because he does understand the circumstances you're in. You know what I mean? It makes God's touch that much sweeter because we know when we don't deserve for him to come or we know at this time he's treating us unfair in our estimation. And yet God still says, I understand the context. I need you to know God always understands. David said in Psalms 34, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all his fears. Psalms 34, how can God deliver me from all my fears unless I know there's a God that cares and hears? So let's understand how powerful this is that Habakkuk was still sitting there waiting on God and it was not a safe environment. Come on, let me give you some Bible history so you learn what happened. If I were to take you back to the times that Habakkuk is actually preaching in or prophesying in, you will understand why this burden was so powerful on Habakkuk. Let's go back to my Bible readers. You already know this, that there was Solomon. I mean, there was Saul, David, and Solomon. They were the three kings that actually were a part of the United Kingdom of God, right? They all served God for about 40 years apiece. And then came the time when Solomon died, the last king of the United Kingdom. His son, Rehoboam, took over. When Rehoboam took over, Rehoboam actually told the people in 1 Kings chapter 12, I'm going to be a harsh king. I'm going to put more on you than my father put on you. And when he said, I'm going to be a harsh king, all of a sudden, the people rebelled. There was another man named Jeroboam who raised up a rebellion against Rehoboam. And when he raised up the rebellion against Rehoboam, there was a split. That's how we got the 10 tribes of the north, which kept the name Israel, and the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, which kept the name of Judah. That was the northern tribes and the southern tribes. So watch this. The 10 northern tribes, or Israel, for the next 200 years after the split, they found themselves run, walking away from God, walking around in idolatry, never listening to the word of God, not setting up the things of God. They found themselves in a position where they were not listening to God they backslid, idolatry, you name it, they were doing it. Well, God got tired because one king after another king after another king, they ended up with 20 
evil kings in that 200 year period in the northern tribe. And then in 722 BC, we had the Assyrians come down and they captured and took Israel away. Now watch this. Most Bible readers know this. That was the end of Israel. Because what happened is through generations and generations, they began to intermarry with the Assyrians. And when they began to intermarry, there were no pure blood uh, Jews left during this period of time. Once they went into Babylon, um, Assyrian captivity. And when they got into captivity, captivity, we found out that the Assyrians now, when they married them, that's where the Samaritans came from, who the Jews hated. Uh, parenthetically, in Jesus' time, you remember the woman at the well, and it says Jews doesn't have any dealings with the Samaritans. That's because the Samaritans were not pure Jews. They were intermingled. And that came about, and they disappeared. Ten tribes of God's people, you need to hear this, all disappeared because of their sins. There was two godly tribes left. I'm getting to, to Habakkuk. There were two godly tribes left, Judah and Benjamin, called Judah. During the same 200-year period, there were good kings, bad kings, and great kings in the southern kingdom. As a matter of fact, you, you, I can give you some of the names you'll remember. Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a great king. He was the one God turned back time for, turned the clock back. Why? Hezekiah was a great king, and at the time that the Assyrians were attacking, they could have come down further and took over Judah, but because of God's power and prayer by Hezekiah, turning the nation on to praying for God, they were delivered. And during this time, he became uh, he was a great king during this time. When he died, his two sons, Manasseh and Ammon, Manasseh and Ammon, evil kings, they took the kingdom down further. And then there was a series of other kings. Now watch what was happening on the outside. The Assyrians were getting weaker. Babylon was rising up. The Egyptians decided, we want to go and we want to join in with the Assyrians to capture Babylon. So they were leaving Judah alone for a while because they were fighting each other. So they said, we're going to join in with, with the Egyptians, with the Assyrians, and capture Babylon. But the Egyptians wanted to go through Judah and Hezekiah uh, Josiah was the king now. Josiah said no. Now, Josiah was one of the most powerful kings of the southern kingdom. He was the one who brought back the word of God, the commandments of God. He rebuilt the temple. He tore down the groves. He did. It. When you read about Josiah, I got to move on. There's a, there's a revival under Josiah. There's always a revival under someone who does what God says. Getting to, getting to um, Habakkuk. And so after this time, we found out that there was an evil king come into play. Uh, the next, the king that was on the throne when Habakkuk was, was actually prophesying, we believe, was Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim was an evil king. He set the conditions that Habakkuk was talking about. He liked partying. He liked drinking his wine. He liked building houses. He made the people slaves. He wouldn't pay the contractors. He let the rich get oversee the poor. The streets weren't safe to walk in. People were being mugged and jumped. And Habakkuk in his mind is saying, God, we're the only godly people left. You're going to let this happen to us? Now you see how important it is that Habakkuk held on. I'm giving somebody work. All that to tell you is your context can't be any worse than Habakkuk's. And watch what he did. He decided, I'm going to watch and wait on God. Can I give somebody some Bible right now? You got to learn how to wait on God. Isaiah 40 and 31. They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not be weary. Walk and not faint. What I'm trying to tell you is once you learn the secret to all faith is waiting on God. I'll make it plain to you. Psalms 27, 13 and 14. Psalms 27, 13, 14 says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is David. You know what David said? No matter how far down you go, I got a word for somebody. Wait on the Lord. Don't just wait. Be of good courage. Wait on the Lord. That's how he ended that Psalms. We read Psalms 34 all the time, but I'm encouraged because here is what happens when we wait. Waiting is just not for God. Waiting sometimes is so we can catch up to where God wants to take us. Waiting is so God can bring the path past his plan for our lives, which is much better than our plan for our lives. Psalms 27, 13, 14 says we need to learn to wait on the Lord. Be strong. I love Lamentations 3, 25. 
The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. The Lord is good for those who wait on him and the soul who seeks him. Think about the biggest miracles, the most powerful anointings in the Bible did not come through being in a hurry. It came through waiting, but not just waiting, but waiting like a vodka, saying, I'm going to wait to see what he's going to say to me. I love it. What is it? What do I mean? Give me an example, preacher. Abraham. Abraham was called when he was old, and yet Abraham had to wait 20 years till he was 100 for the promise to come to pass. Many of us would have given up. Hebrews 6.15 says, listen to how Abraham waited. Hebrews 6.15 says, Abraham waited patiently. Can I stop? Wait patiently. Whew. Calm down. You say, Pastor, but you don't know what's going on. Wait patiently. I've been waiting. Wait patiently. And when you wait patiently, it says, and Hebrews 6.15, he received what God had promised. Think of someone else who waited on God, and you will find out. One of the, the, the people who I know had a great relationship with God, was treated unfairly, but they waited on God, and God raised them up to a position that they never would have, like, I'm about to use the wrong word, that God told them, they were going to be in that position in a dream, and he reached the place that God had dreamed about. Joseph, waiting in prison. Watch this. Joseph, loving God, spoiled, right? Had his coat of many colors, running around teasing his brothers. But Joseph, thrown into a pit, cheated by Potiphar's wife, put in the prison. All of this, his brothers against him, Potiphar's wife against him, placed in the prison by Potiphar. Why? All of this, God was taking him through a process so that he could learn or get to the position God had for him. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody, there's a position God has for you that you may not like, but it is better than the position you would have had if you did not wait on God. Take God's word for it. He waited and waited, and all of a sudden, Joseph was raised up to the second in command over Egypt. A lot of times, we look at that and say, wow, you know, if I wait on God, I'll be raised up in this secular world. That's not the blessing. The blessing was he was able to bury his father. He was able to get favor in Egypt to work the principles of God. The blessing was not the blessing he got in Egypt. The blessing was when he worked when he was able to fit back into God's plan and get God's people back on track. What are you talking about, Reverend? Genesis 50 and 20. Joseph said this to his brothers once they finally came. He said, you intended what you did to me to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, saving many lives. Listen to me. Even though what you're looking at in your life, you may think it's for harm. I need you to know because of God's love for you, God always intends it to be for your good. Waiting on God brings us to a position where we will be blessed. And all I tell people is in our waiting, there comes a growth that we would not have had if we did not wait. Look at the next verse of, of chapter 2. It says, uh, I will wait and see. I'm on the second part of, of verse 1 of chapter 2. I will wait and see what he shall say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Please know that Habakkuk had enough sense to know. Even though I'm questioning God, I know God still has the right to reprove me or correct me because when God corrects me, He's sending me into a place that I am more in line with his blessing. How, no, 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 no. How many of us know that we haven't gotten to the place where we don't need God's correction? Everything coming out of our mouth is not gold. 
all of our prayers and all of the holy stuff we doing don't mean we're right all the time. A person who wants to see God's blessing, who wants to talk to God, know that God has a right to actually reprove him. Look at verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, here's God's answer to Habakkuk. Sometimes we get this wrong. He said, write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is not yet. It's for an appointed time. But at the end, it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. There's a word again. Wait for it, because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Blessing from God. The word tells us, wait on it, but you need the vision. So here's what happened. Habakkuk said, God, I want to know what's going on. Why are you coming to that? God said, Habakkuk. Here's my answer. So you understand it. Write this vision. Wait a minute. He said, you can't tell somebody else what I'm going to tell you if you can't see it first. So you have to write the vision. Once you write the vision, then what I'm about to do to deliver my people, you'll be able to tell them. And when the vision is clear, the person who gets the vision can run with the vision. So what God was in fact saying is, Habakkuk, if I just answer you without an explanation and I give you the vision of my deliverance, that you won't be able to tell anyone and the rest of my people may not be delivered. So no, I want you to write the vision, just like he told Moses, write it on the tablets, make it plain. And even if the vision does not come in your time, wait on it. It may tarry. But here is the final blessing. It will come to pass. Hallelujah, somebody. Somebody ought to say that back to me. It will come to pass. Somebody put that in the chat room. I don't know how long I've been waiting on God, but I felt a right then a, a kind of a, a spiking of the Holy Spirit to tell somebody, it will come to pass. What is your dream? It'll come to pass. What is your vision? It'll come to pass. Our problem is we have never put all of our commitment on something and just waited on it. We wait for a little while and then we we move off of the marker. We wait until we get this gruntle. We wait until we feel like we waited long enough. God said, no, if it tarry, wait. And he said, it will come to pass. Your blessing is right now, no matter what the enemy is saying, what you're, God said, it will come to pass. I like it. But here goes the verse. If there's ever a verse that everyone knows, we may not know the book of Habakkuk. There's several verses in Habakkuk we've heard. The Lord is in his holy now. There's some verses I can tell you that you would recognize. But since we don't read this book much, we don't know. But here is where this verse came from. In Habakkuk, it says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Let's balance this out. Many times we hear that word, the just shall live by faith. And we go after faith. The just shall live by faith. Believe it or not, that is what the entire Bible is about. I, I actually looked this up. The, the Jewish Talmud actually used this verse in Habakkuk as a central thought in the verse. And there is a famous line by Rabbi Similar that is used often by Jewish rabbis. It says, Moses gave Israel 613 commandments. David reduced them to 11 in Psalms 15. Micah reduced them to 3 in Micah 6 through 8. Isaiah reduced them to 2 in Isaiah 58 and 1. But Habakkuk reduced the entire commandment of God to one thought. The just shall live by faith. Here it is. Habakkuk complained. He asked God questions. God said, I'm going to give you some answers to the questions. But remember, because of all the other stuff I just told you, the reality is, at the end of the day, you still have to live by faith. And even when your conditions <clears throat> contradict your faith, you have to live by faith because faith is going to be the only thing that can get through to the heart of God. You must live by faith. What am I saying? I'm saying that the first part of this verse, verse 2 and 4, we're going to go to verse 5. We don't like because the verse says he's lifted up 
in his self. Look at verse 4. It says, because his soul was lifted up in him. Here's what God is saying. You like to come at me and ask me all kind of questions, but don't think that you can live by faith if you're also lifted up in your pride. Because a lot of times our assumption when we go to God is that, um, God, I'm coming to you in a righteous way. The stuff I'm asking you about, come on, God, Stevie Wonder can see this ain't right. God is saying sometimes you're lifted up in your pride. Pride is... Every man has pride. I was listening to one commentator that shows us pride is not just for the rich. Pride is not just for the poor. Everybody has pride and can be lifted up because pride is a sin that the devil was guilty of first. But it's a prevalent sin. It's a weapon the enemy likes to use. And it's a part of our sinful nature. We are so prideful that we have torn up marriages by our pride. We have torn up relationship with people by our pride. We've left churches by our pride. We needed to, we, we've done some, won't say I'm sorry because of our pride. And God is saying, before you can tell me you got to live by faith, no one who's lifted up in pride can live by faith. I'm getting ready to explain to you why I'm using the Babylonians, but you need to first know that you've got to make sure you understand that before you can live by faith, you need to understand that your pride has to be brought down so that God can bless you. You can't receive faith if you have pride. I'm going to tell you something, guys. Pride is something that will keep you from God's anointing. You can be so prideful that you refuse to forgive or make up with somebody. You can be so prideful, and that person might have been a part of your assignment from God so that you can reach your assignment. I believe one day God's going to wipe tears from our eyes when he says, do you know that two simple words stopped you from reaching my best riches? And those two words were, I'm sorry. Or three words, I was wrong. Prideful people cannot say any of them. Subsequently, what this verse is saying, prideful people also can't live by faith because our mind is too wrapped up in us. Um, let me give you an example of what God means by faith. Romans 4, 16 to 20, we talked about Abraham. But listen to the language of Romans 4, chapter 4, verse 16 and 20. Therefore, therefore, uh, how you get to the place where God can bless you. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, the Jew, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, by faith I have made thee the father of many nations before him whom he believed. Even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things that be not as though they were. Sarah's dead womb, Abraham's deadness, God quickened, and he called forth a blessing that should not happen. He said, I'm calling things as though they were, even though they're not. He said, here's a part about faith I think we don't get. Who against hope, believe in hope. We can't ever be hopeless when we believe in faith. Because faith says hope may be against you, but you keep hoping anyway by faith. The prize may be out of your reach, but don't give up by faith. I'm helping somebody right now. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith. Stop, Pastor. Read it. Not it didn't say he was not weak. Sometimes you're weak, but your faith is strong in God, and that's how God can keep you. You're weak in your own actions, but he said he was he being not weak in his faith. How do I know that? He considered not his own body. Now I'm dead. His body was weak, but he still believed in God. When he was about 100 years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb and here is where we miss our blessings. He didn't stagger 
One minute I'm going this direction with God. Another minute I'm going this direction with God. And God is saying, you know enough about me to stay straight. But to keep going over here and keep going over here. And God said, I can't bless you. But we need to understand, but we're strong in faith. And here is what the bottom line of faith is in that text. Giving glory to God. So he said that he knew that there was pride. So after he said this to Abaka, we go into, I want you to write this down, five woes. The actual thing says, God now tells him how he's going to do it. And he said, I'm going to use the Babylonians, but this is not just to the Babylonians. I need you to know that you're telling me about how bad the Babylonians are and they're worse than you. And God is saying, no, I've seen all, na all nations go through this cycle of good and evil. He said, I'm going to use this period to bless my people. Watch this. And I will also bring judgment on the Babylonians and the Chaldeans in the process you will get free, but I will also let you know while you're looking at this, not to go back and act like them. You know, they, he act like the Babylonians were acting any worse than God's people had acted. Sometimes we accuse people of stuff that we already did or stuff that we're doing right now, but nobody knows it because it makes us seem righteous. But here's the first woe. Here's what God said. Write these down. If you really want to live by faith, if you really want to know how I'm going to bless you, God said, you need to make sure you do not copy the actions and characteristics of the Babylonians. First, he said, woe against aggression. Let's look at verse 6. I'm going to start reading at verse 5. You also, because he transgressed by wine, uh, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlarges his desire as hell and is as death and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. That's what I was explaining a minute ago. God is saying it's just not the Babylonians. It's all of us, right? And then he goes into, shall not all these take up um, parable against him and taunting proverb against him and say, here's the first quote, woe to him that increaseth and in that which is not his. How long to him and to him that lading himself with thick clay? Shall they not rise up suddenly? Shall they not bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Watch this. Here's what God is saying. I should have given you an NIV on that. But what God is saying is, um, if you are an aggressive person and you go around taking stuff and you got a reputation like the Babylonians and the Assyrians to take, how long do you think your aggression can last before you get what you're supposed to get? God said, I'm not going to let anybody get away with that. I'm going to make sure that uh, the law of reciprocity, you weep what you sow. So many people want deliverance, but they don't understand that God is saying in those verses 6 through 8, he's saying, I'm not going to let, I need you to know, even though I'm using Babylon, their very aggression is what's going to kill them. Watch me, somebody. A person who comes out against you aggressively, and it looks like they're overpowering you, don't you retaliate and act like them. If you stay in the right position, God will bless you, even though it looks like they're winning. Many times it looks like somebody's winning, but God is saying, all that aggression cannot stop my plan. Come on, I don't have to get to the fact that um, when, the, when the king threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the flame, he, man, he said, heat it up. How did it has ever been heated? And make sure, throw them in. The men died and threw them in. All that aggression. And that king had to back up and say, wait a minute. I threw three men in. I see four. And the fourth man looks like the What am I saying? God always shows up on the side of the one who is not aggressive. Now listen to me. It's hard. Come on, y'all. To have somebody be aggressive to you and you're not aggressive to them. Can I let y'all know? 
Y'all know one of my things I'm dealing with, and I am better. In 2021, I'm better. Hallelujah. I'm better. Better. And that is driving. When somebody cut me off on the road, and I was coming down the road. I'm driving uh, uh, another car. My car's in the shop. I'm coming down the road, and this man just cut me off. And so I'm driving down the road. He just cut me off, almost hit me, slowed down. And I'm in the car just talking. And, man, and, and, and I was getting ready to just step on the gas and pass him. But you know what happened? I happened to, you know how you're looking, and it's another car. I looked in the mirror, and the face that I saw in the mirror was almost demonic. My face was all frowned up and wrinkled up. And, I, and it was like God brought me back and said, leave that man alone. Have you ever seen your face when you were being angry and aggressive and demonic with folks? I know someone, don't turn me off. I'm talking about you. You ever seen your face when it happens to you? All I'm saying is God is saying, I'm going to turn. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get the Babylonians because of their aggression. But I don't want you to act like that. Second, well, it's in verses 9 to 11. Watch this. Verse 9. Whoa. See it? Here it is. To him that covereth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his rest, his nest, excuse me, on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and has sinned against your own soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Look at what God said. God said, if you are a person of greed and covetousness, and you want everything for you, and it's all about you, you bring shame to your own body. Some of us wonder why I haven't gotten blessed. God said, if you're the kind of person, everything is all about you. All I'm trying to get is for me. I'm trying to get. And it's one of the things I, I told you I don't understand sometimes about, you know, when I'm working with other generations that may not have gone through a period of biblical literacy. They want everything in the church to turn around and be for them, but they don't want to get on board with what some things that God has to say. I'm not saying that any generation is right. I, I like to have my church understand there's five different generations in the church. And I need you to know that I want every generation to be spoken to by the word of God. But remember, God has to have the last say. It can't be my way or no way. Too many Christians live the my way or highway thing. Like it, it's, it's like either you do it my way. I don't understand. Uh, the pastor didn't do it my way. The deacons didn't do it my way. The church didn't do it my way. My husband didn't do it my way. And you get to this point where everything is about you, God said, whoa, if you are a covetous person, if you're one of them selfish person, God said, you are going to get to the point. This concerns the building of your own nest, is the language used, instead of looking out for people. I believe one of the, um, which is hard to do, one of the, the most blessed people there is, and I got to hurry, is those who think of other people before they think of themselves. I want to give you a ticket. If you want to get out of the deepest ditch you're in right now, I dare you to start thinking about blessing and help. So this Christmas, you're sitting there wondering, do I have enough money to go Christmas shopping? I need to get this for this one, this for Sometimes we buy gifts so people think good of us. It's for us and not the people. Sometimes people aren't even thinking about what we're buying them. But we get worried about our image, so we worry about spending all our money for stuff. But what I'm saying is, if you're the kind of person that doesn't even think, does this person have food? Does this person... Can I give something to someone else? God said, your covetousness is going to be your own undoing. Verse 12 to 14. You go to third woe. Write this down. Woe against folk who are violent. Look at it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and establish a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord, of the Lord's host, that the people shall labor in the very fire and the people shall weary themselves for vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.
God said, um, Woe unto you who are violent. The scripture tells us, I think it's Psalms 127, um, that um, unless the Lord build a house, it will not stand. Unless the Lord build a city. Psalms 127 and 1. Sometimes we build stuff violently or by blood. It's different from covetousness where we just greed. This is violent. Where we don't care what we do to someone else. We just become violent. Look what the text says. It's, it's scary to me if you understand the language God is saying there. He's saying because at the end of the day, verse 14, the earth's going to be filled with God's glory. And so God's going to deal with you on the basis of your violent nature. You know, many times we got this thing, I'm saved, uh, and I'm saved, and that's all there is to it. I don't care how I act, I know I'm saved. I don't care how I cuss folk out, I know I'm saved. I don't care how I treat people, I know I'm saved. Do you? Maybe you know it, and God does it. Some of us don't understand that we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And when you can be violent, and it does not, and your spirit is not sensitized to it in any manner, then that puts you in a place where you can't be blessed. Here's the fourth woe. Woe against humanity. This is a serious one. Let's read verses 15 to 17. Thou art filled with shame. Excuse me. Woe unto him. Here's the woe, verse 15. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. And that putteth thy bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. It's heavy. What? Thou art filled with shame for glory. Shame for glory. Man, that's heavy. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and the shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Woe against a person who goes against another person's humanity. One who wants to expose another person's weakness. One who wants to prey on another person. One who sits around and thinks of ways I can watch this person fall. One who wants to rape Using this word contextually, and you want to take advantage of someone against their will. So you want to get them drunk first. You want to get them to the place that they can't stand, and then you expose them. God said, woe unto you. You will not get away with playing and doing that to other people. Nothing good comes from that. And finally, verse 18 through 20. Woe against idolatry. The five woes. God says, the worst woe of all. Everything I said is bad. But here you are coming to me, and yet you want to serve other gods. Or I'm not truly your God. I, I'm just somebody you come to when you get in trouble. But I'm not truly your God. Look at verse 18 and 20. When he said, God says, what profit, what profit if the graven, graven, talking about graven images, graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make the dumb idol. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake! To the dumb stone. Arise! It shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. God is saying, no matter what's going on in your life, I am the only true and living God. And anything else that you have made a God is why there is failure in your life. God said, you need to understand when God says woe, remember the woes he used to do against the scribes and Pharisees in the New Testament? Woe is when God is saying, you better wake up and you better hear this because this is what I'm going to do to the Chaldeans, to the Babylonians. But I also want you to write this vision down because I want people to know 
you can't act like this as my people anyway. Now, now, this text, but the Lord is in the holy temple, let all the earth keep silent before him. That's, that's a great opening uh, worship line that we heard people use. You may not have known where the line came from, but that's it. It is the last verse of the second chapter of Habakkuk. So remember, we're going to chapter 3 next week. But watch this. Habakkuk, the first two chapters, Habakkuk, the first two chapters, his complaints. The first two chapters, he's getting in God's face. The first two chapters, he wants to know, God, what you going to do? The first two chapters, he's, you know, come on. And some people live their whole life like that. You never know who you really are until you get to the third chapter. This third chapter is a poem of faith. Um, Martin Luther, who is the father of modern Protestant faith, it was Martin Luther who took this verse, the just shall live by faith, and it became the cornerstone of the Protestant movement. It became the cornerstone of all of our churches that we need to know. I can't live by man's rituals. I can't live by what the Pope says. I can't live by what other folks say. At the end of the day, I got to live by faith. So I hope you enjoy this. I hope you understand. I hope you're getting something out of this. Name of this message, name of our teaching, God, I need some answers. God said, I'm going to answer you, but you still got to live by faith. But you still watch where we go next week. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan. I want you to go in to read the third chapter of Habakkuk. And what you need to do, I'm reading the King James because it, it, it stimulates, you know, from my past what I've been doing. But you can read the uh, NIV or you can read... Um, a New King James Version, and probably get a better literal translation. But um, I just love when when hearing and, and feeling what that King James is saying because I've studied it. So I want you to get into your book, find out, and if you took nothing away tonight, take this away. I'm going to live by faith. I'm going to make sure I don't do any of those woes, and I'm going to make sure I wait, hear what God's going to say, and if I don't like what he said, I'm still going to live by faith. God bless you. I need you to uh, go to our website. This is the time of year where we're doing extra giving with our Building Better Lives. We fed over a thousand people in the last two months in both of our locations. Right now, we're looking to um, do more um, with our, you know, our CDC. We're looking to do more as we collaborate with folks. So, if you want to have a good place, our toy drive. You know, we're doing the Angel Tree where we're actually, you know, getting presents for. Uh, kids of incarcerated folk. We're making sure that the Angel Tree Project, we're doing that. Plus, we're doing toys for our local kids around. We have a grief workshop on this Saturday. And go to our website. Please get this. Go to our Facebook. We have a grief workshop. Many people, their mental health is being challenged. Please come out to this. So it's in person, so you got to call, or you can come out. It's going to be a little continental breakfast. And then we have um, Dr. Angela Clack, who is a trained Christian Psychologist, and she's going to be able to give us some important biblical applications to help our mental health. So I need you to come and be a part. It's going to be at our Vineland location, which is um, 1837 Northeast Boulevard. Just go to our website, get directions, come there. You're invited. Free will offer. It doesn't cost a thing. God bless you. Remember, you can ask God questions, and he will answer. See you next week.